2023 <coughs> webinar series. Um, we're super excited about this one because with the warming weather, we're looking forward to spring. Um, I know it's actually getting a little bit colder today again, um, but overall trend towards the warmer weather. Um, and on that note, we're going to be talking today about milkweed restoration and gardening as we prepare for spring planting and welcoming back our pollinators. Um, unfortunately, one of our speakers had a personal emergency and won't be able to join us today. So today's discussion might be a little bit shorter than usual, um, but we're still super excited to be hearing from our other presenter. This meeting is being recorded. Um, so first, as a brief note on our organization, People and Pollinators Action Network is a Colorado-based nonprofit where we focus on community-based work and scalable projects ranging from habitat creation to education and outreach to policy and advocacy. Um, we're always looking to inspire action at a grassroots level and get people involved in pollinator conservation and the protection of human health. Today's overarching theme is going to be milkweed, um, which is an important and very timely subject for a number of reasons. As most of you probably know, milkweed is a host plant for monarch butterflies whose larvae um, rely on the plant. Milkweed is also an important resource for a lot of other species of native pollinators, so it's become a really popular plant to grow among native gardening enthusiasts. Um, and milkweed, like other seedlings, is often treated with harmful pesticides even before purchased by the public. Um, and these pesticides are toxic to the monarchs and the other pollinators that visit. So there's a really huge need for organic milkweed varieties that are native to your particular region. Um, so as I mentioned before, Chris won't be able to join us today, um, but we may still be able to hear from her in a future webinar, so stay tuned. Um, however, our speaker today is Sharon Silvaggio, who works with the Xerces Society's Pesticides Program and pushes for prevention-based pest management solutions. Um, today, she'll be speaking about how we can source and grow milkweed in our gardens in a way that's safe for pollinators and creates valuable habitat. And before we jump in, I just want to thank you all again for being here. It really means a lot for a small nonprofit like ours to have all of you engaged in our projects. We hope you learn a lot today and become inspired to help make a difference for pollinators in your own way. Um, a few reminders for the webinar itself. Please just stay muted during the presentation um, and leave any questions you may have along the way in the chat. We will be having a moderated question and answer session at the end, time permitting, we should have plenty of time. Um, and the webinar will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel after the session. Also, if you like these webinars and are excited about our mission, please consider donating so we can continue doing this kind of work and putting on events for you all. You can visit our website, which is just www.peopleandpollinators.org um, to find our donation page. And I'll also drop the link to the page in the chat. With that, thank you guys so much and we hope you enjoy. Um, well, thank you so much, Nicole. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yep, you're looking great. Okay, great. Well, uh, I just wanna say thanks to PPAN and especially Joyce and Nicole. I, I first met Joyce, I don't know, about a year and a half ago, my boss had said to me, you should connect with this really great nonprofit um, in Colorado called People and Pollinators Action Network. And, and so I met Joyce and over the last year, I've really been, um, it's always just sort of like, I, I feel like Joyce is so solid. <laughs> <laughs> and being in meetings with her, like she can just kind of cut right to the chase, you know, kind of just um, really focus on what's important. And this is a great organization. I don't live in Colorado myself, but it's just been a pleasure to um, know that PPAN exists and is doing this great work out there. So really appreciate the opportunity to talk today. Um, the title of my presentation, Pollinator Safe Plants for Bee and Butterfly Gardens and Restoration is broad. But I, as Nicole mentioned, I'm really going to be focusing on monarch butterflies specifically, and really monarchs are just kind of um, a proxy in many cases. You know, it's something that we care about, something that the public cares about. But there are, you know, thousands of other butterfly species out there that um, 
a native to the United States, um, probably not that many native to Colorado, but um, everything that we can do to continue to provide habitat for them is really important. But I'm gonna kind of talk about what we need to think about when we're providing that habitat, particularly when we're buying plants. So um, you may know that monarchs are being considered for the endangered species list. Um, and that process is continuing. We probably um, won't have a, a final decision for a few years. They're currently um, a candidate, which is sort of a, like a purgatory for <laughs> species that have been petitioned, but I, I can anticipate that changing. In the meantime, um, people are paying attention and um, the US Fish and Wildlife Service has done some background work based upon the work of many scientists and organizations in the past to sort of pull together uh, what, what are some of the threats that face monarchs. And one of those is pesticides. It was a, a threat identified during the listing process um, because monarchs you know, exist across the United States as a migratory species, they have widespread um, basically a very high likelihood across the country of being exposed to pesticides. And when you think about their life cycle, we've got, of course, the adult that we're familiar with, and we also have a caterpillar. And um, they can both be exposed to pesticides, either by being sprayed directly or by contacting pesticide residues on a plant, like topically, in other words, with some part of their body after a spray. And they can also consume pesticide residues, basically the part of the pesticide that remains in or on the plant. And that um, pesticide residue consumption is probably most important for the caterpillar stage because they are so voracious, they're growing, um, but the adult can also consume residues in the nectar as they're feeding. So um, these are things that we need to think about as you know, potential impacts to them. Now, many people across the United States, probably in your communities as well, are restoring um, monarchs. And this is really, really important. Um, milkweed is the key plant that the, the caterpillars need and um, the adults need nectar plants that um, they can sip from as they're migrating. Um, and so it's not news to anyone here that they need more habitat. And what happened to the old habitat? Well. It got turned into farmland or housing, and there's just not as many milkweed and nectar plants out there anymore. So we got to restore habitat. But we also need to protect the plants that we're, we're, we're obtaining for habitat restoration, whether it's at a garden scale or whether it's at a broader scale, perhaps at a park or within a watershed. We really need to protect those plants from pesticides. And the US Fish and Wildlife Service actually recommends insecticide-free plants be used in restoration and protected from pesticide contamination after planting. So basically through the whole life cycle of the plant before you, know, you put it out there and then while it's available. And as you know, milkweeds are perennials and they'll just come back year after year. So we need to think about the, that for the long run. So this brings up a big question. If we're trying to find um, insecticide-free plants or even pesticide-free plants, you know, what do we know about the other plants that we buy? Are they safe? What do we have in terms of studies that tell us whether the pesticide residues on nursery plants? Well, we do have some studies and the news is not great. They show that typically we, we do have many pesticides in and on nursery plants, typical mu multiple pesticides in any one plant. And sometimes those residue loads reach levels able to kill bees. Why am I talking about bees? Well, pretty much all the pesticide toxicology is looked at through the lens of bees. That's kind of just the way the EPA does things. They'll choose a species and say, we're just going to say that a bee is the surrogate, you know, so everything that we're gonna try to find out is all gonna be sort of funneled through this honeybee lens. And from that, we'll make extrapolations to other species. So when, what we do know is that those nursery plants residue loads are sometimes high enough that, that bees can be killed. And when the nursery exposure, some nurseries have monarch caterpillars coming in. Um, so, you know, getting laid on the milkweed plants, some 
nurseries are open and they have native bees coming in. So when there's pesticides applied at the nursery that can expose the adults or the larvae directly. But um, many nurseries are also applying what's known as systemic pesticides, which basically penetrate the plant and move, into, move in and through the plant and sort of last in the plant for sometimes quite a while. And that means that residues are available in the leaf or nectar many months later, um, certainly shortly later, and, and depending upon how persistent the chemical is, sometimes months later. And this is particularly something of concern when we look at woody plants because they can express systemic pesticides for months to years after an application. So this is a little bit of, of something that we know, but we didn't actually until recently really know anything specifically about milkweed and whether it might also contain risky pesticide residues from applications at the nursery. And we also didn't know much about how sensitive monarchs are to pesticides. Are they more sensitive than bees, less sensitive than bees, the bees that we have tox toxicology information for? So two years ago, um, some of our staff, Sarah Hoyle, who um, recently moved on, um, Amaya Code, my supervisor, um, they designed the study and they teamed up with the University of Nevada, two researchers there, a grad student named Chris Halsh, and a uh, professor there named Matt Forrester. And they collaborated to examine whether pesticides were present in milkweed plants available at retail locations. So we put out a call to a lot of our volunteers and staff. Some of you may have participated in this. I see Littleton is in here. Um, but staff and volunteers went um, to along, you know, just towns along the migratory pathway and purchased milkweeds from nurseries at 33 different stores across 15 states. And um, altogether, between staff and volunteers, 235 different plants were purchased. And from each one of those, the leaves were collected. And these were sent to a lab for analysis. So um, I'm going to talk about what we found. Um, for a few of the plants, we, we collected two weeks later those leaves again, we wanted to find out if the residue levels had declined in two weeks and if they had, which ones had declined and how quickly. So, so those, that pesticide lab that looked at these plants um, screened them for 92 pesticides. So we were able to determine the presence or absence and the concentrations of 92 different pesticides. So, what we found out is that every single milkweed plant was contaminated. Um, and in total, there were 61 pesticides detected. Most of these were insecticides and fungicides, but we also did find some herbicides. And one, what's known as a synergist, it's often applied in mixture with other pesticides to make them more effective. So we wanted to know, you know, we, we got the data back, we found out what the concentrations were, we had all the stats, you know, the average, the range, the peak, etc. And we wanted to know what this meant for monarchs. But depressingly, the literature on how monarch how pesticides affect monarchs is still really slim. So out of the 61 pesticides that we found in the plants, only nine of those pesticides have actually been tested directly on monarchs. So um, we were only able to actually analyze, you know, in a sort of robust scientific manner, what the toxic effects were for those nine pesticides. But before I go into that and what that told us, um, just a few other details about what we found. Out of um, all those 235 plants, there was an average of 12 pesticides per plant, but it ranged from only two in a one or two of the plants up to 28 pesticides per plant. And when you have pesticides in mixture um, like this, and we see it in water all the time, we see it in honey beehives, we see it in soil media that we often find multiple pesticides whenever we sample these kinds of what we call environmental media, you know, think of anything out in the environment, sample it. And, you know, you find multiple pesticides. And what that means is that 
when there's multiple pesticides, there can be a possibility that there's additive or even synergistic effects between those multiple pesticides. Unfortunately, there's also very little science about that. So we, we just don't know. So we were looking sort of at one, one pesticide at a time. One thing um, to mention here, we had done a similar study two years earlier, just looking at um, milkweed plants that were sort of growing in the wild, mostly next to ag lands in the Central Valley. And in that study, we found an average of nine pesticides per plant. So it was kind of surprising that these nursery milkweeds had 25% more pesticides than these ag land pesticides. <laughs> so it raised a question again um, about whether these chemicals have the ability to interact and um, have higher toxic effects. And also what's going on with nurseries that there's so many pesticides. So what we found, just looking at those nine pesticides that we had tox toxicology data on, we found that almost 40% of the plants contain pesticides at levels that would be considered toxic to monarchs. And these plants that were toxic came from about half of the sampled locations. If you recall, we, we were, um, there were 33 different towns, 15 different states, about half of those locations had plants with residues at, at levels that were of concern. Um, now, what was it that we found that was so concerning? Well, it wasn't insecticides necessarily. I, we did find a lot of insecticides. And if we had tox data on insecticides for monarchs, we might have been able to say something about it. But what we found is that we had fungicides that were associated with shorter wing lengths in monarchs. And this raises the concern that caterpillars who are consuming these compounds could ultimately experience reduced ability to migrate. This has been seen in other butterflies when they have smaller wing lengths um, as a result of pesticides. So we're concerned about that because obviously this is a migratory species. So a few other notable findings from the study is that the number of different pesticides and their concentrations were quite variable between all the 235 plants. There were, there were some plants that had tags that touted their value to wildlife like pollinator friendly, or, you know, attracts monarchs, or, you know, things of that nature. Unfortunately, and surprisingly, those kinds of plants, they were actually almost twice as likely to have harmful fungicide levels than plants without the wildlife tags. Another huge surprise for us to see that. Um, looking back at insecticides, the levels that we found we definitely would consider high for bees if they were found in pollen and, or nectar, but we don't know effects for monarchs. Um, and you know, we were testing leaves in the study. The last thing that we found that was kind of interesting is that, what, do you remember I mentioned that we kept some of the plants for two weeks and we pulled some of the leaves again and tested them. And we did see that some of the concentrations declined in those plants for some of the compounds. So there's certain pesticides that are considered more short-lived, uh, spinosad and acetate are two examples. We did see reduction in those chemicals after two weeks, but some of the pesticides, including like this fungicide called azoxystrobin, which was one of the ones that was problematic for toxicity, it has a long half-life and it did not change. I hope that made sense. I know I'm using some technical language here, but Essentially, um, you know, it, these pesticides can last for a while, some of them in plants. There's quite a few things that we, we couldn't find out from the study. We didn't know when in the, in the chain of production, the pesticides reach the plant and how long they, you know, each one will last in milkweed leaves. We got a little bit of data on that last one, but, you know, plants are often like, propagated at one nursery and then they'll go to a grower nursery, a wholesale nursery, and then they'll end up at the retail nursery. And sometimes there's even more than two or three steps in the chain. And we don't know when those pesticides were applied. We also don't know whether they were a result actually of direct application for pest management purposes, or if they just landed on the milkweed from applications to nearby other crops. Some of these nurseries have you know apple farms or something next door um, and drift or runoff or 
or even via the irrigation system at the nursery um, to other plants, that all of those sort of all those sort of flows can can result in residues on milkweed plants. And um, we suspect that that occurred um, in at least one of these nurseries after talking to them about what they applied. We also couldn't test for every single pesticide out there. We didn't test for a broad group of pesticides known as pyrethroids, so we don't know if those were present. And as I mentioned, we only had toxicity data for nine out of the 61 chemicals. So how do those other 52 chemicals affect monarchs? We don't know. Um, finally, we don't know whether the combinations of pesticides found increase the likelihood of negative effects, in other words, that they're additive or synergistic. So lots of concerns that came out of that study. And so what do we do about it? Um, we, I think it's a good question to ask, why are we finding pesticide residues in nursery plants? Why do so many nurseries use pesticides even on plants known to have great value to bees and butterflies. And so um, we've been spending some time here at Zosie's um, examining the nursery industry, talking to a lot of growers, reading a lot of papers. And based upon that research, that you know, sort of investigation, um, I've sort of put together this short list of what the root causes of pesticide residue. First of all, a lot of plants are grown in greenhouses. These are often, very conducive to pest outbreaks. They're humid, they're warm. And um, so, you know, things can grow very rapidly. And growers are, all, are always concerned that sales might be affected if there's plant damage or presence of insects. So this whole sort of like cosmetic imperative, like the plants have to look beautiful at the point of sale. This drives pesticide use. Another really interesting thing is that pesticides are quite cheap compared to labor. So if you're looking at, okay, I'm gonna hand squish all the aphids on my milkweed plant. Well, that's gonna take somebody you know, working and you're gonna pay them an hourly wage or a salary. But in comparatively, pesticides are much cheaper than paying labor. Pesticides, when you look at sort of like the budgets of an average nursery, there's been studies on these. Pesticides comprise 2% of their budget, but labor is 26% of their budget. So you can see how growers would be reluctant to adopt practices that are going to take yet more labor and increase their labor costs. Another reason is that states and the federal government, each state and the federal government have what they call plant health regulations. And these are uh, regulations that were basically put into place for a very good reason, basically to prevent invasive, you know, insects or plants or diseases from crossing state lines. But the way it works out in practice is that that means that nursery growers are always sort of running scared that the regulators are going to like stop a shipment and they won't be able to, you know, send the plants on their way because, the, you know, that the regulator might, the inspector may come in and say, oh my God, You've got a few aphids on this plant. We can't let you ship it. So, and I've heard this from a number of different growers that they're more likely to apply pesticides sometimes right before they ship it so that they can pass that inspection with no problem. A couple of other things. Nurseries can also use, this is also sort of surprising, but true, that um, they can actually apply higher rates of chemicals per plant for some pesticides than what EPA allows for food crops. I think that this goes back to the whole sort of like human health, you know, EPA keeps maybe a closer eye on, you know, what we're actually eating. And if something's not being eaten by humans, it's like, oh yeah, you can use more. But, you know, those of us who are concerned about the environment, kind of recognizing that there are species beyond humans in our world and we need to let them eat too, <laughs> it creates a problem. And then finally, um, the last two things that, you know, there's just generally kind of like um, a lack of awareness from buyers. And I'm not necessarily talking about you here today, because I know that there's a lot of motivated people out there, but from the broader group of people who are buying plants. And in that, I include, you know, large buyers, um, people who are doing a lot of work um, as landscape designers or installers, and they just may need a lot of plants and, and they may not want to spend time really worrying about what's inside every single plant. And it's kind of difficult to dialogue about this. 
Um, finally, no labeling rules about what gets used on plants. There's, we don't even have reporting rules for pesticide use uh, for any state outside of California. So, so that's just a little bit of like things to consider as we try to figure out how do we solve this problem with, you know, kind of remembering all these things, you know, where are the barriers to just saying, oh, let's just go pesticide free, which is a really excellent goal, but these are the barriers that we run into. Hmm. Okay. So, you know, probably a lot of you remember back in, you know, about 2013, 2014, 2015, we all started hearing a lot about neonics and how toxic they were to bees. And the nursery industry was particularly um, sort of targeted with campaigns. You know, a lot of gardeners and were going in and saying, I don't want neonics on my plants. And they did actually respond. Um, they, you know, as a, an industry, you know, really diminished the number of neonics that they're using as an industry. We, we know that from um, reporting in California. We also know it from some studies that have been published. However, um, neonics, you know, were, they were serving a purpose for these growers. They were helping them kill off some pests. And, and the easiest thing for them to do was to basically switch to other chemicals, which is exactly what they did. So um, what we know from a study that was done in 2021 is about half of nursery producers use neonics this year or last. That's, you know, down, but um, still about half. And some growers have switched to other insecticides. Others have not, but a lot of it depends upon their perception of labor cost. Again, this is based on a study where they um, had these intensive interviews um, and looked at hundreds of nurseries across the country. When you look specifically at California, this chart was created by Susan Kegley um, at the Pesticide Research Institute in California. And she, um, gather data from California's pesticide use reporting system, just to compare like, okay, let's look at the four neonics, which are the four on the top of five actually, how have those changed? And what about these, these new ones that nurseries can use, cyanotronilopril, chlorantronilopril, and sulpivodifurone, all of which we're concerned about because of the effects to bees and or butterflies. And what we're seeing is that imidacloprid, which was in top place, can you guys see my, my, my cursor, my mouse? I do not think so. Oh, okay. Well, that top line, you can see how it kind of falls as it goes from left to right. That's imidacloprid. That was the most heavily used insecticide, but it fell. And a lot of these other neonics sort of stayed static. Um, but what came up here in a big way, cyanotronilopril, pretty toxic insecticide, very long lived. In other words, a lot like a neonic. Chlorantronilopril, the orange one at the bottom, the cyanotronilopril was in light blue, by the way. The chlorantronilopril um, sort of still at a pretty low level, but flopivodifurone also coming up, not as much as, that's the one in the red um, near the bottom here that kind of is coming up as you can see. Um, so, we have concerns because these chemicals have their own problems. Um, sometimes the marketers are saying these are reduced risks, or, or they're, you know, these are this is the answer to not using Munich anymore. But the problem is, is that they have their own set of concerns. So this is not necessarily a step in the right direction. However, we do believe that there are solutions. And these are milkweed seed pods, this beautiful photo. And just as they stand shoulder to shoulder here. We do think that there are solutions if we work together. So it really is about addressing those root causes. We're not asking people to stop planting milkweed because you know, the milkweed is still really important. It's, it's the problem really is this chemical dependent pest management that permeates all of our food and nursery crop production. So we, we want people to keep planting. So there's a different solution. Um, it's, every small step and contribution is going to help. So before I begin on those, I just wanna say that Xerces solutions and messaging on solutions is a little bit more nuanced than a lot of organizations, a little bit more complex. 
um, because we want to be in it for the long run. We want, we don't want a quick fix, like just banning neonics um, and everything solves the, the problem. Because as I pointed out, some of these other chemicals are also really of a lot of concern. So the things that I'm going to talk about and say, you know, I, I hope that you will do this might be a little bit more complex than what you were thinking, but I'll, I'll, I'll just go through these. The first thing is making clear to your nurseries if you're buying plants. I want pollinating safe plants. These are plants free of pesticides that could be harmful to bees, monarchs, and other pollinators. And just starting that conversation by saying what you want is just really important. This is always easier if you're talking to the producer nursery directly, but even if you're a step or two removed, you're buying plants at a retail nursery, or if you work through a broker because you're a big landscape installer, you know, it's important to talk about this. And you may need to, you know, plan a little bit further ahead, change the way you buy, um, maybe even let them know you're willing to pay more for pollinator safe plants. And making this statement just once is not as impactful as saying it every time you buy plants, because the more people hear something, the more they pay attention. But we don't want you to just to stop. That's the most important thing is saying what you want. But, you know, we also want people to ask about how the plants were grown. So you can ask, do they have organic pollinator plants, organic plants and seeds? A lot of organic seeds are out there, not so many organic pollinator plants, but it still helps to ask. And if they can't offer you these organics, and we know that those are hard to find, you can ask them if they have plants that have been grown without neonics and other similar systemic insecticides. Um, if they have, you know, they're showing that they want to do things right. And that's a big step in the right direction. But it's important to do more. We've seen that going neonic free isn't enough. Um, and then, so the third thing is, you know, if you decide, okay, they don't have neonic free plants, I'm just going to go shop elsewhere, you know, let them know. But you can also ask what steps they take to offer plants grown using pollinator-friendly pest management. And um, I'm gonna talk about what that means on the next slide. We believe that, you know, really addressing root causes of pests in, you know, nursery and greenhouse production or crop production, it's really um, the same thing. It comes down to these three practices or framework. First, prevention practices to keep pests from kind of getting out of control in the first place. Monitoring before pesticides are used. In other words, not just applying pesticides out of habit or by the calendar, but seeing whether the pest is even a problem right now. And the third thing is limiting pesticide harm. So when pesticides are used, basically choosing less toxic pesticides and applying them in a manner that is the most targeted and reduces exposure. So um, these are really important principles of pollinator friendly production. And so when you ask about, you know, what do they do to offer plants that have been grown with pollinator safe practices, you'll be talking about these three things with them. Before I kind of give a little bit more detail about that, just um, we encourage people to be, you know, bold, you know, like ask for the manager, ask for, you know, a person to take some time out of their day and talk to you, but also be friendly and do some homework ahead of time, familiarize yourself with the nursery, you know, come in with a smile, build a rapport, and you may find that people can't answer your questions. So ask if you could speak to someone who can and follow up if you need to. Maybe they're not in on Saturday or whatever, but they might be in on Monday. So follow up and whenever possible, if you can leverage your purchasing power, like if you're a large buyer, you could consider a contract grow so that you can say, this is exactly how I want my plants grown. And you can specify which pesticides may and may not be used on those plants. This is something that we're doing at Xerces. We are contract growing a lot of plants. Um, and our goal is to have reliably safe plants, basically finished plants, that are free of pesticide residues that could result in harmful pollinators. And so we looked at all the pesticides that nurseries could be using out there. And we looked at the effects um, as much as we could find. And we were able to find a lot of information, but 
well, you know, do they affect adult bees? What about the, the offspring or the larvae? And the, what about butterflies and their caterpillars? And so we looked at all that and basically came up with a series of specifications to protect um, bees and butterflies and the, the, the young um, from these pesticide residues once they're ready. So we, the specific provisions of that is that we don't allow, for under contract rows, we're saying you can't use any of these pesticides. We have a list like that, but then we have another list we say, you can use these, but not two weeks before you deliver them to us. Um, that would allow these more shorter lived chemicals time to decline. Um, if you buy plants frequently as a, you know, you may be a farmer, you may be a retailer, you may be a city or a restoration organization or a landscape designer or an installer, consider a purchasing policy. Um, this is a proactive way to integrate pollinator safety into your purchases. And if you work with nurseries under those grow contracts, as I said, you'll be able to specify exactly what you want in advance. So, Going back to that whole pollinator friendly thing or pollinator safe, how do you learn about that? What exactly do you ask about when you're looking at those three concepts of prevention, monitoring, and limiting pesticide harm? Well, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail today because look, I'm so lucky that I was the only one here today because I've taken up all the time. <laughs> but if you um, look, search out these two fact sheets at our website, buying bee safe plants and offering bee safe plants, you can find the questions that we recommend asking. And um, the first one is sort of for smaller buyers, really helpful. And the second one is for nurseries and larger buyers. But I really think for anyone, it's really helpful to look at both. And when you are at the nursery, leave a copy of the offering Be Safe Plants because you never know, you know the impact that that may have. With that, I want to say thanks to sh for showing up. Thanks to PPAN for inviting me. And it's time for your questions. And if you have a question later that didn't we didn't get to, feel free to email us at pesticides at xerces.org. And uh, so, yeah, thank you. Uh, I also just want to say thanks to our um, funders and our supporters who are listed here and newer supporters who may not be listed here. <laughs> um, but thanks to everybody who supports um, Xerces. We're a nonprofit, um, we're donor supported, and you can become a member if you like at that link. Thank you, I'm gonna stop sharing right now. Wonderful, thank you so much, Sharon. That was amazing. Um, and we already have quite a few questions coming in. If people have more questions, please keep dropping them in the chat. Um, great, so I'll just jump right in. Um, first one's pretty straightforward on, it was your first or second slide. Um, I think the title was Monarchs, the problem of pesticides. Um, someone asked what the orange beetle is that's pictured um, in the image with the monarch butterfly. Oh. <laughs> great question. I'm not sure, I'm not an entomologist myself. I've sort of picked it up through osmosis um, being with Xerxes from, all the other people who are really good at all that stuff. You know what's coming to mind and I could be completely off, but like soldier beetle? <laughs> maybe somebody knows if you know, maybe put it in the chat because I'm not an entomologist and never look closely at that. It does look like someone just put the same answer as you. Oh, awesome. Um, so <laughs> you may be correct on that. <laughs> Perfect. Um, okay. Um, also kind of early in your presentation, um, someone asked, what contexts are we most concerned about with regard to pesticide exposure? I think this is referring to um, like the contact versus ingestion versus the, the various ways that monarchs can become harmed. Yeah, okay. Certainly ingestion because the caterpillars are spending time on leaves um, and you know they go through like six or seven different generations before they're adult. Uh, you know, in stars, I mean, before they become adults, and then the adults repeat the whole thing all over again. And, um, you know, but I think the direct exposure is important too. Like, um, if you imagine yourself being a caterpillar on a plant, and suddenly a pesticide application occurs, and it just 
coats your body, you know. Um, but we don't have any data that shows that one is more important than another because we haven't sort of like tried to put all those pieces together. So they're all kind of important. Um, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, next question. Do plants treated with pesticides pass on the chemicals to their offspring via seed dispersal? Ah, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know the answer to that. You know, that's a great question question. I actually had not thought about that. I'm going to write that one down. Um, do monarch, so you're basically saying, do monarch adults um, pass on to their offspring or the caterpillars through the entire, you know, does it basically go to the next generation? Um, I think the question was about if the plants pass on, like if the plants are treated oh, with pesticides, yeah. but oh, okay. the monarch thing is also yeah. interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we don't have a lot of data, unfortunately, about pesticide residues um, in seeds, but we know certainly know it's possible because um, seeds are a storage organ and plants are transporting chemicals around their, you know, the whole, you know, structure, you know, the leaves, the plants and roots and, and, and um, but whether there is much there and whether it, basically becomes, you know, something to be concerned about in the next generation. We don't unfortunately have much data on that. Uh, we think about it, but unfortunately I just have really nothing to go on. Okay. Yeah. So, well, this is why all of you are so important. The more that we can get people interested, the more science happens around it. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, someone, this is kind of a common question in different variations. Um, Someone asked, I grew showy milkweed from seeds collected from wild milkweeds in a nearby, nearby state park. Can I assume that those are free from pesticides? Um, I, I wouldn't assume anything. You know, I think what, what, what makes sense is to figure out who's managing that land. And you can go in and talk to them um, and find out what kind of pesticides are being used here. Maybe there's none. But pretty much most park districts that I've ever worked with, like say it's a, it's a park, um, they use herbicides at least for invasives management. Um, sometimes, you know, you may have something like emerald ash borer in the area or something. And in that case, you have some pretty toxic insecticides that are being injected into trees. And then when they lose their leaves, there's still residue in those leaves that come down into the soil. So I think the best approach is to talk to whoever the manager is of that place and try to find out. Um, again, we don't really know if the residue would carry through to the next generation. Um, so it might not be a huge concern, but it's great to just enter those dialogues because then those managers know that there's people out there that really care and they might think about doing things a little bit differently, maybe putting a buffer around you know, any milkweed that they have and so on. If they're not doing that already, I would hope that they would be. Right. Yeah. It's got to be so context specific. Yeah. Um, so moving on to the study that you were talking about, um, do you know if there was a specific species of milkweed that was focused on for that nursery study or were several species sampled? There were several species sampled, including tropical milkweed, which is um, widely grown um, not uh, recommended actually um, for lots of places. Um, but yeah, I can't remember all of the species, but I think there were four or five, six different species that we collected because we were buying from East Coast stores, you know, in, in Colorado and the Midwest and on the West Coast as well. And there were quite a few different species being grown. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Um, someone asked, and I know your expertise may be more on the pesticide side of things, so if you can't answer any of these, that's totally fine. Um, but someone asked, how easy is it to grow milkweed from seed? What I've heard, well, okay, I tried growing milkweed from seed once and I had no luck. <laughs> um, but I've heard that the seed that's native to where I live, which is Oregon, needs to be what they call stratified, which means it has to go in the fridge or the freezer for a while. What I have found easier is buying the plants, you know, from um, the stores already as, you know, young seedlings, but, but there are people that are successfully growing from seed. Um, 
So I could refer you maybe to some other Xerxes people who know a lot more about that and might have some tricks up their sleeve. Or you could just contact, you know, kind of like the info at Xerxes.org um, or whatever our sort of broad to, to get a few more tricks. And there might be local organizations that can help you too. Maybe PPAN has that info. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we will link um, the Xerxes info in our follow-up email. So anyone who's interested in following up um, more on specifics, feel free to do so. Um, monarch specific question, um, where do monarchs go when they're ready to form a cocoon? How far do they go? And do they have any particular type of medium they prefer? Um, they, they stay on the milkweed plants and um, they hang. So they basically on the plant that they were, um, the eggs were laid on, the adults are laying the eggs on the milkweed, the caterpillar hatch out and they grow. Um, and then they eventually form that cocoon or chrysalis on the milkweed plant. So they're right there. They're pretty much, you know, like, you know, staying in one neighborhood their whole life, right? Or, not their whole life, but, and then at that point, when the chrysalis is ready and the adult emerges, the adult then moves on, moves further north and goes to, you know, the next stopping point essentially along their migratory path until they finally essentially turn around up in the Northern states of Canada. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's where they are. And those milkweed plants really can be anywhere. They might be in ag lands, they might be in someone's backyard, where, you know, they might be in a park where those um, eggs are getting laid and where the, the young are developing. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, we're, we're running low on other people's questions. So people, if you have them, drop them in the chat. Um, but I have several questions that I am curious about as well. Um, what are the next steps for getting monarchs on the endangered species list? You mentioned they're a candidate right now. Do we need more studies on population levels or what happens next? Yeah, candidate is sort of, like I said, it's kind of like this weird purgatory because sometimes species stay at the candidate level for years. Um, what it means is that it was um, warranted but precluded by higher priority work that the US Fish and Wildlife Service had to do. In other words, it meets the criteria for endangered species listing, but they don't have time to do it right now. They don't have enough staff. So when it will come off, um, I am not sure, but it, my recollection, I'm a little bit foggy on this, it's been a while since I looked at this, is that the continuing to do um, more background um, research on this. And if there's somebody who remembers this better, knows better um, themselves, feel free to put it in the chat. But there is some background work happening. And I think that there's going to be some, you know, kind of like five year time frame where they're going to look at it again, that maybe they committed to this time. I, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit foggy on that, but okay. no clear answer. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, more specific to your work, do you have any thoughts as to why the plants that were marked with wildlife or pollinator tags um, in that nursery study, why those ones had higher chemical levels? Do you think that was like certain retailers spray their plants more and also happen to tag more of their plants? Or do, do you have any thoughts of drivers behind that trend? I wish I did. You know, we do know that some retailers do spray their plants and including putting on fungicides and insecticides sometimes. Some um, take care to use things that they think are pretty, you know, innocuous like soaps or oils and not the more heavy duty synthetic chemicals. Um, but we don't really know where and why. It, it really definitely was a surprise. Um, it, um, it's not a surprise to see fungicides on nursery plants. Fungicides are probably much more heavily used than insecticides in nursery production. Again, I think going back to that humidity and greenhouse production and all of that, um, diseases can just start and, and you know grow so rapidly. And many nursery growers are sort of, um, look, they look at fungicides, they, they actually call them preventatives versus curatives. And they are basically told like, you have to put them on every every week in order for this to basically stop, you know. And so they're used to using fungicides frequently. They're used to using them without thinking that they might be toxic to anything. 
because the conversation's been all around neonics and other insecticides. Okay. And so, um, so I think we as environmental advocates and gardeners, you know, knowing that a broader array of pesticides can actually be harmful to the wildlife that we're trying to protect, you know, it's good to know that, hey, we, we really need to take a look at fungicides as well as insecticides. And herbicides, they don't actually get a complete pass either because we see some negative effects of herbicides as well. So that's the unfortunate truth. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, on that note, I don't know, Joyce, if you have anything that you wanna bring up before we conclude here? Couple things. Thank you so much, Sharon. Wonderful presentation, really appreciate it. I will say that PPAN did participate in the study by buying, purchasing plants in Littleton. Um, I don't know the specific results of those, what was found on those plants. So that's um, for another day. And uh, along with Circe's and some other organizations, we're running a awareness raising campaign around this issue um, on social media uh, over the next two months. So if you follow Xerces or PPAN, please watch for those posts and share them broadly. We are trying to really spread this message so people can be informed uh, consumers. And I see that Ingrid has given me a little tap to um, go way off topic here and talk about something very important um, to what we're working on at the Capitol. So I will mention this since we have a few minutes. We are working to restore local control over pesticide use to our local communities uh, through the Pesticide Applicators Act. And the bill number we're working on is um, SB 23-192 and we're looking to get an amendment into that bill, which would restore the right of communities to have some authority over their pesticide use. And we like to say in a nutshell that this enables them to be able to better protect special unique resources and public health. Um, and I'm certainly um, happy to offline answer more questions about that. But in the meantime, I will just post a page in the chat about this campaign. And we encourage you to call your legislators. And um, I'm just doing this as I'm speaking. Uh, please call your legislators about this um, quickly because this bill is going to hearing uh, this coming Monday. Uh, appreciate the moment to give you this little advocacy uh, minute. Thanks everybody. Thanks for coming today. Thanks so much. And thank you again to Sharon. Amazing talk. Um, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their Wednesday.